Sections 1 through 17 of Of Holy Virginity, De Virginitate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of Holy Virginity, De Virginitate by St. Augustine of Hippo. Translated by Charles John Cornish, 1810-1870. to 1870. Sections 1 through 17. From the Retractions 2.23. After I had written On the Good of Marriage, it was expected that I should write On Holy Virginity, and I did not delay to do so, and that it is God's gift, and how great a gift, and with what humility to be guarded, so far as I was able I set forth in one volume. This book begins, etc. We lately put forth a book of the good of marriage, in which also we admonished and admonish the virgins of Christ, not on account of that greater gift which they have received, to despise in comparison of themselves the fathers and mothers of the people of God, and not to think those men whom the apostle sets forth as the olive, that the engrafted wild olive be not proud, who did service to Christ about to come hereafter, even by the begetting of sons, on this account of less desert, because by divine right continence is preferred to wedded life, and pious virginity to marriage. Forsooth, in them were being prepared and brought forth future things, which now we see fulfilled in a marvelous and effectual manner, whose married life also was prophetic, whence, not after the wonted custom of human wishes and joys, but by the very deep counsel of God, in certain of them fruitfulness obtained to be honored, in certain also barrenness to be made fruitful. But at this time, towards them unto whom it is said, If they contain not, let them be married, we must use not consolation, but exhortation. But them unto whom it is said, Whoever can receive, let him receive, we must exhort, that they be not alarmed, and alarm that they be not lifted up. Wherefore, virginity is not only to be set forth, that it may be loved, but also to be admonished, that it be not puffed up. This we have undertaken in our present discourse. May Christ help us, the Son of a Virgin, and the spouse of virgins, born after the flesh of a virgin womb, and wedded after the spirit in virgin marriage. Whereas, therefore, the whole church itself is a virgin espoused unto one husband Christ, as the apostle says, of how great honor are its members worthy, who guard this even in the flesh itself, which the whole church guards in the faith, which imitates the mother of her husband and her Lord. For the church also is both a mother and a virgin. For whose virgin purity consult we for, if she is not a virgin? Or whose children address we, if she is not a mother? Mary bare the head of this body after the flesh. The church bears the members of that body after the spirit. In both, virginity hinders not fruitfulness. In both, fruitfulness takes not away virginity. Wherefore, whereas the whole church is holy both in body and spirit, and yet the whole is not virgin in body, but in spirit. How much more holy is it in these members, wherein it is virgin both in body and spirit? It is written in the gospel of the mother and brethren of Christ, that is, his kindred after the flesh, that when word had been brought to him, and they were standing without, because they could not come to him by reason of the crowd, he made answer, Who is my mother, or who are my brethren? And stretching forth his hand over his disciples, he says, These are my brethren, and whosoever shall have done the will of my father, that man is to me brother and mother and sister. What else teaching us, than to prefer to kindred after the flesh, our descent after the spirit? And that men are not blessed for this reason, that they are united by nearness of flesh unto just and holy men, but that by obeying and following they cleave unto their doctrine and conduct. Therefore, Mary is more blessed in receiving the faith of Christ than in conceiving the flesh of Christ. For to a certain one who said, Blessed is the womb which bare you, he himself made answer, Yea, rather blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Lastly, to his brethren, that is, his kindred after the flesh, who believed not in him, what profit was there in that being of kin? Thus also her nearness as mother would have been no profit to Mary had she not borne Christ in her heart after a more blessed manner than in her flesh. Her virginity also itself was on this account more pleasing and accepted 
in that it was not that Christ being conceived in her, rescued it beforehand from a husband who would violate it, himself to preserve it, but, before he was conceived, chose it, already dedicated to God, as that from which to be born. This is shown by the words which Mary spoke in answer to the angel announcing to her conception. How, says she, shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Which assuredly she would not say unless she had before vowed herself unto God as a virgin. But, because the habits of the Israelites as yet refused this, she was espoused to a just man, who would not take from her by violence, but rather guard against violent persons, what she had already vowed. Although, even if she had said this only, how shall this take place, and had not added, seeing I know not a man, certainly she would not have asked how, being a female, she could give birth to her promised son, if she had married with purpose of sexual intercourse. She might have been bidden also to continue a virgin, that in her by fitting miracle the Son of God should receive the form of a servant, but being to be a pattern to holy virgins, lest it should be thought that she alone needed to be a virgin, who had obtained to conceive a child even without sexual intercourse, she dedicated her virginity to God, when, as yet, she knew not what she should conceive, in order that the imitation of a heavenly life in an earthly and mortal body it should take place of vow, not of command, through love of choosing, not through necessity of doing service. Thus Christ being born of a virgin, who, before she knew who was to be born of her, had determined to continue a virgin, chose rather to approve than to command holy virginity. And thus, even in the female herself, in whom he took the form of a servant, he willed that virginity should be free. There is, therefore, no reason why the virgins of God be sad, because themselves also cannot, keeping their virginity, be mothers of the flesh. For him alone could virginity give birth to with fitting proprietary, who in his birth could have no peer. However, that birth of the Holy Virgin is the ornament of all holy virgins, and themselves together with Mary are mothers of Christ, if they do the will of his Father. For Mary also is on this account the mother of Christ in a way more full of praise and blessing, according to his sentence mentioned above, Whosoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, that one is to me brother and sister and mother. All these degrees of nearness of kin to himself he shows forth in a spiritual manner in the people whom he has redeemed. As brothers and sisters he has holy men and holy women, for as much as they are co-heirs in the heavenly inheritance. His mother is the whole church, because she herself assuredly gives birth to his members, that is, his faithful ones, also his mother is every pious soul, doing the will of his father with most fruitful charity, in them of whom it travails, until himself be formed in them. Mary, therefore, doing the will of God after the flesh, is only the mother of Christ, but after the Spirit she is both his sister and mother. And on this account, that one female, not only in the Spirit, but also in the flesh, is born a mother and a virgin, and a mother indeed in the spirit, not of our head, which is the Saviour himself, of whom rather she was born after the spirit, forasmuch as all who have believed in him, among whom is herself also, are rightly called children of the bridegroom, but clearly the mother of his members, which are we, in that she wrought together by charity, that faithful ones should be born in the church, who are members of that head, but in the flesh the mother of the head himself. For it behooved that our head, on account of a notable miracle, should be born after the flesh of a virgin, that he might thereby signify that his members would be born after the spirit of the church a virgin. Therefore Mary alone, both in spirit and in flesh, is a mother and a virgin, both the mother of Christ and a virgin of Christ. But the church, in the saints who shall possess the kingdom of God, in the spirit indeed is altogether the mother of Christ, altogether a virgin of Christ, but in the flesh not altogether, but in certain a virgin of Christ, in certain a mother, but not of Christ. Forsooth both faithful women who are married and virgins dedicated to God, by holy manners and charity out of a pure heart and good conscience and faith unfeigned, because they do the will of the Father, are after a spiritual sense mothers of Christ. 
But they who in married life give birth to children after the flesh give birth not to Christ, but to Adam, and therefore run, that their offspring, having been died in his sacraments, may become members of Christ, for as much as they know what they have given birth to. I have said this, lest haply married fruitfulness dare to vie with virgin chastity, and to set forth Mary herself, and to say unto the virgins of God, She had in her flesh two things worthy of honor, virginity and fruitfulness. Inasmuch as she both continued a virgin and bore, this happiness, since we do not both have the whole, we have divided, that you be virgins, we be mothers. For what is wanting to you in children, let your virginity, that has been preserved, be a consolation. For us, let the gain of children make up for our lost virginity. This speech of faithful women married unto holy virgins would anyhow be to be endured, if they gave birth to Christians in the flesh. That in this alone, save virginity, the fruitfulness of Mary in the flesh should be more excellent, that she gave birth to the head himself of these members, but they to the members of that head. But now, although by this speech, their vice such as on this one account wed and have intercourse with husbands, that they may have sons, and have no other thought of their sons, than to gain them for Christ, and do this so soon as they can, yet are not Christians born of their flesh, but made so afterwards, the church giving them birth through this, that in a spiritual manner she is the mother of the members of Christ, of whom also after a spiritual manner she is the virgin. And unto this holy birth mothers also, who have not born in the flesh Christians, are workers together, that they may become what they know that they could not give birth to in the flesh, yet are they workers together through this, wherein themselves also are virgins and mothers of Christ, that is to say, in faith which works through love. Therefore no fruitfulness of the flesh can be compared to holy virginity even of the flesh. For neither is itself also honored because it is virginity, but because it has been dedicated to God. And although it be kept in the flesh, yet it is kept by religion and devotion of the spirit. And by this means even virginity of body is spiritual, which continence of piety vows and keeps. For even as no one makes an immodest use of the body, unless the sin have been before conceived in the spirit, so no one keeps modesty in the body unless chastity have been before implanted in the spirit. But, further, if modesty of married life, although it be guarded in the flesh, is yet attributed to the soul, not to the flesh, under the rule and guidance of which the flesh itself has no intercourse with any beside its own proper estate of marriage, how much more, and with how much greater honor, are we to reckon among the goods of the soul that continence whereby the virgin purity of the flesh is vowed, consecrated, and kept for the Creator Himself of the soul and flesh. Wherefore, neither are we to believe that their fruitfulness of the flesh, who at this time seek in marriage nothing else save children, to make over unto Christ, can be set against the loss of virginity. Forsooth in former times unto Christ about to come after the flesh, the race itself of the flesh was needful in a certain large and prophetic nation. But now, when from out every race of men and from out all nations, members of Christ may be gathered unto the people of God and city of the kingdom of heaven, whoever can receive sacred virginity, let him receive it, and let her only, who contains not, be married." For what, if any rich woman were to expend much money on this good work, and to buy from out different nations slaves to make Christians, will she not provide for the giving birth to members of Christ in a manner more rich and more numerous than any, how great soever, fruitfulness of the womb? And yet she will not therefore dare to compare her money to the offering of holy virginity. But... If, for the sake of making such as shall be born Christians, fruitfulness of the flesh shall with just reason be set against the loss of chastity, this matter will be more fruitful, if virginity be lost at a great price of money, whereby many more children may be purchased to be made Christians, than could be born from the womb, however fruitful of a single person. But, if it be extreme folly to say this, let the faithful women that are married possess their own good, of which we have treated, so far as seems fit, in another volume. And let them more highly honor, 
even as they are most rightly used to do, in the sacred virgins, their better good, of which we are treating in our present discourse. For not even herein ought such as are married to compare themselves with the deserts of the continents, in that of them virgins are born. For this is not a good of marriage, but of nature, which was so ordered of God, as that of every sexual intercourse whatever of the two sexes of humankind, whether in due order and honest, or base and unlawful, there is born no female save a virgin, yet is none born a sacred virgin. So it is brought to pass that a virgin is born even of fornication, but a sacred virgin not even of marriage. Nor do we ourselves set forth this in virgins, that they are virgins, but that they are virgins dedicated unto God by pious continence. For it is not at a venture that I may say a married woman seems to me happier than a virgin about to be married, for the one has what the other as yet desires, especially if she be not yet even the betrothed of any one. The one studies to please one unto whom she has been given, the other may in doubt unto whom she is to be given. By this one thing she guards modesty of thought from the crowd, that she is seeking not an adulterer, but a husband in the crowd. Therefore that virgin is with good reason set before a married woman, who neither sets herself forth for the multitude to love, whereas she seeks from out the multitude the love of one, nor, having now found him, orders herself for one, taking thought of the things of the world, how to please her husband, but has so loved him of fair beauty above the sons of men, as that, and because she could not, even as Mary, conceive him in her flesh, she has kept her flesh also virgin for him conceived in her heart. This kind of virgins no fruitfulness of the body has given birth to. This is no progeny of flesh and blood. If of these the mother be sought for, it is the church. None bears sacred virgins save a sacred virgin. She, who has been a spouse to be presented chaste unto one husband, Christ, of her, not altogether in body, but altogether in spirit virgin, are born holy virgins both in body and in spirit. Let marriages possess their own good, not that they beget sons, but that honestly, that lawfully, that modestly, that in a spirit of fellowship they beget them, and educate them, after they have been begotten, with cooperation, with wholesome teaching, and earnest purpose, in that they keep the faith of the couch one with another in that they violate not the sacrament of wedlock. All these, however, are offices of human duty. But virginal chastity and freedom through pious continence from all sexual intercourse is the portion of angels, and a practice, incorruptible flesh, of perpetual incorruption. To this let all fruitfulness of the flesh yield, all chastity of married life. The one is not in man's power, the other is not in eternity. Free choice has not fruitfulness of the flesh, Heaven has not chastity of married life. Assuredly, they will have something great beyond others in that common immortality, who have something already not of the flesh in the flesh. Whence they are marvelously void of wisdom, who think that the good of this continence is not necessary for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, but for the sake of the present world, in that, forsooth, married persons are strained different ways by earthly cares more and more straitened, from which trouble virgins and continent persons are free, as though on this account only it were better not to be married, that the straits of this present time may be escaped, not that it is of any profit unto a future life, and that they may not seem to have put forth this vain opinion from out the vanity of their own heart, they take the apostle to witness, where he says, But concerning virgins I have not command of the Lord, but I give counsel, as having obtained mercy from God to be faithful. Therefore, I think that this is good on account of the present necessity, because it is good for a man so to be. Lo, say they, where the apostle shows that this is good on account of the present necessity, not on account of the future eternity, as though the apostle would have regard for the present necessity otherwise than as providing and consulting for the future, whereas all his dealing calls not save unto life eternal. It is therefore the present necessity that we are to avoid, but yet such as is a hindrance to somewhat of the good thing to come, by which necessity the married life is forced to have thought of the things of the world, how to please the husband, the wife, or the wife, the husband. 
not that these separate from the kingdom of God, as there are sins, which are restrained by command, not by counsel, on this account, because it is matter of condemnation not to obey the Lord when he commands, but that which within the kingdom of God itself might be more largely possessed, if there were larger thoughts how they were to please God, will assuredly be less, when, as this very thing is less thought of by necessity of marriage. Therefore he says, Concerning virgins I have not command of the Lord, for whoever obeys not a command is guilty and liable for punishment. Wherefore, because it is not sin to marry a wife or to be married, but if it were a sin, it would be forbidden by a command, on this account there is no command of the Lord concerning virgins. But since, after we have shunned or had forgiveness of sins, we must approach eternal life, wherein is a certain or more excellent glory, to be assigned not unto all who shall live forever, but unto certain there, in order to obtain which it is not enough to have been set free from sins, unless there be vowed unto him who sets us free something which it is no matter of fault not to have vowed, but matter of praise to have vowed and performed. He says, I give counsel, as having obtained mercy from God, that I should be faithful. For neither ought I to grudge faithful counsel, who, not by my own merits, but by the mercy of God, am faithful. I think, therefore, that this is good, by reason of the present necessity. This, says he, on which I have not command of the Lord, but give counsel, that is concerning virgins, I think to be good by reason of the present necessity. For I know what the necessity of the present time, unto which marriages serve, compels, that the things of God be less thought of than is enough for the obtaining that glory, which shall not be of all, although they abide in eternal life and salvation. For star differs from star in brightness, so also the resurrection of the dead. It is, therefore, good for a man so to be. After that the same apostle adds and says, you are bound to a wife, seek not loosening. You are loosed from a wife, seek not a wife. Of these two, that which be set first pertains unto command, against which it is not lawful to do. For it is not lawful to put away a wife, save because of fornication, as the Lord himself says in the gospel. But that which he added, You are loosed from a wife, seek not a wife, is a sentence of counsel, not of command. Therefore it is lawful to do, but it is better not to do. Lastly, he added straightway, Both if you shall have taken a wife, you have not sinned, and if a virgin shall have been married, she sins not. But after that former saying of this, You are bound to a wife, seek not loosening, he added not, did he, and if you shall be, have loosed, you have not sinned. For he had already said above, but to these who are in marriage I command, not I, but the Lord, that the wife depart not from her husband. But if she shall have departed, that she remain unmarried, or be reconciled unto her own husband. For it may come to pass that she depart not through any fault of her own, but of her husband. Then, he says, and let not the man put away his wife, which, nevertheless, he set down of command of the Lord. Nor did he then add, and if he shall have put her away, he sins not. For this is a command, not to obey, which is sin, not a counsel, which if you shall be unwilling to use, you will obtain less good, not do any ill. On this account, after he had said, you are loosed from a wife, seek not a wife, because he was not given command, in order that there be not evil done, but was given counsel, in order that there be done what is better, Straightway he added, Both, if you shall have taken a wife, you have not sinned, and if a virgin shall have been married, she sins not. Yet he added, But such shall have tribulation of the flesh, but I spare you. In this matter of exhorting unto virginity and continual continence, so as some little to alarm also from marriage, with all modesty, not as from a matter evil and unlawful, but as from one burdensome and troublesome. For, it is one thing to incur dishonor of the flesh, and another to have tribulation of the flesh. The one is matter of crime to do, the other of labor to suffer, which for the most part men refuse not even for the most honorable duties. But for the having of marriage, now at this time, wherein there is no service done unto Christ about to come through descent of flesh by the beginning of the family itself, 
to take upon one to bear that tribulation of the flesh, which the apostle foretells to such as shall be married, would be extremely foolish, did not incontinent persons fear, lest, through the temptation of Satan, they should fall into damnable sins. But whereas he says that he spares them, who, he says, will have tribulation of the flesh, there suggests itself to me, in the meanwhile, no sounder interpretation than that he was unwilling to open and unfold in words this selfsame tribulation of the flesh which he foreannounced to those who chose marriage, in suspicions of jealousy of married life, in begetting and nurture of children, in fears and sorrows of childlessness. For how very few, after they have found themselves with the bonds of marriage, are not drawn and driven to and fro by these feelings. And this we ought not to exaggerate, lest we spare not the very persons who the apostles thought were to be spared. Only by this, which I have briefly set down, the reader ought to be set on his guard against those who, in this that is written, but such shall have tribulation of the flesh, but I spare you, falsely charge marriage as indirectly condemned by this sentence as though he were unwilling to utter the condemnation itself when he says, But I spare you, for that forsooth, when he spares them, he spared not his own soul, as saying falsely, And if you shall have taken a wife, you have not sinned, and if a virgin shall have been married, she sins not. And this, whoever believe, or would have believed concerning Holy Scripture, they, as it were, prepare for themselves a way for liberty of lying, or for defense of their own perverse opinion, in whatever case they hold other sentiments than what sound doctrine demands. For if there shall be alleged any plain statement from the divine books whereby to refute their errors, this they have at hand as a shield, whereby defending themselves as it were against the truth, they lay themselves bare to be wounded by the devil." to say that the author of the book did not speak the truth in this instance, at one time in order to spare the weak, at another in order to alarm despisers, just as a case shall come to hand wherein to defend their own perverse opinion, and thus, while they had rather defend than amend their own opinions, they essay to break the authority of Holy Scripture, whereby alone all proud and hard necks are broken. End of Sections 1-17 through 17. Sections 18 through 29 of Of Holy Virginity de Virginitate by St. Augustine of Hippo, translated by Charles John Cornish, 1810 to 1870. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wherefore, I admonish both men and women who follow after perpetual continence and holy virginity, that they so set their own good before marriage, as that they judge not marriage an evil, and that they understand that it was in no way of deceit, but of plain truth, that it was said by the Apostle, Whosoever gives in marriage does well, and whosoever gives not in marriage does better. And if you shall have taken a wife, you have not sinned. And if a virgin shall have been married, she sins not. And a little after, but she will be more blessed, if she shall have continued so, according to my judgment. And that the judgment should not be thought human, he adds, but I think I also have the Spirit of God. This is the doctrine of the Lord, this of the apostles, this true, this sound, so to choose greater gifts, as that the lesser be not condemned. The truth of God, in the scripture of God, is better than virginity of man in the mind or flesh of any. Let what is chaste be so loved, as that what is true be not denied. For what evil thought may they not have, here even concerning their own flesh, who believe that the tongue of the apostle in that very place wherein he was commending virginity of body was not virgin from corruption of lying. In the first place, therefore, and chiefly, let such as choose the good of virginity hold most firmly that the holy scriptures have in nothing spoken lies, and thus that that also is true which is said, and if you shall have taken a wife, you have not sinned, and if a virgin shall have been married, she sins not. And let them not think that the so great good of virgin chastity is made less, if marriage shall not be an evil. Yea, rather, let her hence feel confident, rather, that there is prepared for her a palm of greater glory, who feared not to be condemned, in case she were married, but desired to receive a more honorable crown, in that she was not married. 
Whoever, therefore, shall be willing to abide without marriage, let them not flee from marriage as a pitfall of sin, but let them surmount it as a hill of the lesser good, in order that they may rest in the mountain of the greater continence. It is on this occasion, forsooth, that this hill is dwelt on, that one leave it not when he will. For a woman is bound so long as her husband lives. However, unto widowed continence one ascends from it as from a step. But for the sake of virgin continence, one must either turn aside from it by not consenting to suitors, or overleap it by anticipating suitors. But, lest any one should think that of two works, the good and the better, the rewards will be equal, on this account it was necessary to treat against those who have so interpreted that saying of the apostle, but I think that it is good by reason of the present necessity, as to say that virginity is of no use in order to the kingdom of God, but in order to this present time as though in that eternal life they who had chosen this better part would have nothing more than the rest of men and in this discussion when we came to that saying of the same apostle but such shall have tribulation of the flesh but i spare you we fell in with other disputants who so far from making marriage equal to perpetual virginity altogether condemned it for whereas both are errors either to equal marriage to holy virginity or to condemn it by fleeing from one another to excess, these two errors come into open collision, in that they have been unwilling to hold the mean of truth, whereby, both by sure reason and authority of holy scriptures, we both discover that marriage is not a sin, and yet equal it not according to the good either of virginal or even of widowed chastity. Some forsooth by aiming at virginity have thought marriage hateful even as adultery, but others, by defending marriage, would have the excellence of perpetual continence to deserve nothing more than married chastity as though either the good of susanna be the lowering of mary or the greater good of mary ought to be the condemnation of susanna far be it therefore that the apostle so said unto such as are married or are about to marry but i spare you as if he were unwilling to say that punishment is due to the married in another life far be it that she whom Daniel set free from temporal judgment be cast by Paul into hell. Far be it that her husband's bed be unto her punishment before the judgment seat of Christ, keeping faith to which she chose, unto false charge of adultery, to meet either danger or death. To what effect, that speech, it is better for me to fall into your hands than to sin in the sight of God, if God had been about not to set her free because she kept Mary chastity, but to condemn her because she had married? And now so often as Mary chastity is by truth of Holy Scripture justified against such as bring calumnies and charges against marriage, so often is Susanna by the Holy Spirit defended against false witnesses, so often is she set free from a false charge, and with much greater ado. For then against one married woman, now against all. Then of hidden and untrue adultery, now of true and open marriage, an accusation is laid. Then one woman, upon what the unjust elders said, now all husbands and wives, upon what the apostle would not say, are accused. It was, forsooth, your condemnation, say they, that he was silent on, when he said, But I spare you. Who says this? Surely he, who had said above, And if you shall have taken a wife, you have not sinned, and if a virgin shall have been married, she sins not. Why, therefore, wherein he has been silent through modesty, suspect ye a charge against marriage, and wherein he has spoken openly, recognize ye not a defense of marriage? What does he condemn by his silence, them whom he acquitted by his words? Is it not now a milder charge to charge Susanna, not with marriage, but with adultery itself, than to charge the doctrine of the apostle with falsehood? What, in so great peril, could we do, were it not as sure and plain that chaste marriage ought not to be condemned, as it is sure and plain that holy scripture cannot lie? Here some will say, What has this to do with holy virginity or perpetual continence, the setting forth of which was undertaken in this discourse? To whom I make answer in the first place what I mentioned above, that the glory of that greater good is greater from the fact that, in order to obtain it, the good of married life is surmounted, not the sin of marriage shunned. Otherwise it would be enough for perpetual continence, 
not to be specially praised, but only not to be blamed, if it were maintained on this account, because it was a crime to wed. In the next place, because it is not by human judgment, but by authority of divine scripture, that men must be exhorted unto so excellent a gift, we must plead not in a commonplace manner, or merely by the way, that divine scripture itself seem not to any one in any matter to have lied. For they discourage rather than exhort holy virgins, who compel them to continue so by passing sentence on marriage. For whence can they feel sure that that is true which is written, and he who gives her not in marriage does better, if they think that false which yet is written close above, both he who give his virgin does well? But if they shall without all doubt have believed scripture speaking of the good of marriage, confirmed by the same most true authority of the divine oracle, they will hasten beyond unto their own better part with glowing and confident eagerness. Wherefore, we have already spoken enough for the business which we have taken in hand, and, so far as we could, have shown that neither that saying of the apostle, but I think that this is good by reason of the present necessity, is so to be understood as though in this life holy virgins are better than faithful women married, but are equal in the kingdom of heaven, and in a future life, nor that other where he says of such as wed, but such shall have tribulation of the flesh, but I spare you, is to be so understood, as though he chose rather to be silent on, than to speak of the sin and condemnation of marriage. Forsooth two errors, contrary the one to the other, have, through not understanding them, taken hold of each one of these two sentences. For that concerning the present necessity they interpret in their own favor, who contend to equal such as wed to such as wed not. But this, where it is said, But I spare you, they who presume to condemn such as wed. But we, according to the faith and sound doctrine of holy scriptures, both say that marriage is no sin, and yet set its good not only below virginal, but also below widowed continence, and say that the present necessity of married persons is an hindrance to the desert, not indeed unto life eternal, but unto an excellent glory and honor, which is reserved for perpetual continence and that at this time marriage is not expedient, save for such as contain not, and that on the tribulation of the flesh, which comes from the affliction of the flesh, without which marriages of incontinent persons cannot be, the apostle neither wished to be silent, as forewarning what was true, nor to unfold more fully, as sparing man's weakness. And now, by plainest witness of divine scriptures, such as according to the small measure of our memory we shall be able to remember. Let it more clearly appear that not on account of the present life of this world, but on account of that future life which is promised in the kingdom of heaven, we are to choose perpetual continence. But who we must observe this in that which the same apostle says a little after. Whoever is without a wife has thought of the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But whoever is joined in marriage has thought of the things of the world, how to please his wife. And a woman unmarried and a virgin is divided. She that is unmarried is careful about the things of the Lord, to be holy both in body and spirit. But she that is married is careful about the things of the world, how to please her husband. Certainly, he says not, has thought of the things of his state without care in this world, to pass her time without weightier troubles. Nor does he say that a woman unmarried and a virgin is divided, that is distinguished and separated from her who is married, for this end, that the unmarried be without care in this life, in order to avoid temporal troubles, which the married woman is not free from. But she has thought, says he, of the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, and is careful about the things of the Lord, to be holy both in body and spirit unless to such a degree, perchance, each be foolishly contentious as to assay or to assert that it is not on account of the kingdom of heaven, but on account of this present world that we wish to please the Lord, or that it is on account of this present life, not on account of life eternal, that they are holy both in body and spirit. To believe this, what else is it than to be more miserable than all men? For so the apostle says, if in this life only we are hoping in Christ, we are more miserable than all men. What? If he who breaks 
his bread to be hungry, if he do it only on account of this life, a fool. And shall he be prudent, who chastens his own body even unto continence, whereby he has no intercourse even in marriage, if it shall profit him not in the kingdom of heaven? Lastly, let us hear the Lord himself delivering most plain judgment on this matter. For upon his speaking after a divine and fearful matter concerning husband and wife not separating, save on account of fornication, his disciples said to him, If the case be such with a wife, it is not good to marry. To whom, he says, not all receive this saying, for there are eunuchs which were so born, but there are others who were made by men, and there are eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Whoever can receive, let him receive. What could be said more true, what more clear? Christ says, the truth says, the power and wisdom of God says, that they who of pious purpose have contained from marrying a wife make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, and against this human vanity with impious rashness contends, that they who do so shun only the present necessity of the troubles of married life, but in the kingdom of heaven have no more than others. But concerning what eunuchs speaks God by the prophet Isaiah, unto whom he says that he will give in his house and in his wall a place by name much better than of sons and daughters, save concerning these, who make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, for for these whose bodily organ is without strength, so that they cannot beget, such as are the eunuchs of rich men and of kings, it is surely enough when they become Christians and keep the commands of God, yet have this purpose that, if they could, they would have wives, to be made equal to the rest of the faithful in the house of God, who are married, who bring up in the fear of God a family, which they have lawfully and chastely gotten, teaching their sons to set their hope on God, but not to receive a better place than the sons and daughters. For it is not a virtue of the soul, but of necessity of the flesh, that they marry not wives." Let who will contend that the prophet foretold this of those eunuchs who have suffered mutilation of body, that even also helps the cause which we have undertaken. For God has not preferred these eunuchs to such as have no place in his house, but assuredly to those who keep the desert of married life in begetting sons. For when he says, I will give unto them a place much better, he shows that one is also given unto the married, but much inferior. Therefore, to allow that in the house of God there will be the eunuchs after the flesh spoken of above, who were not in the people of Israel, because we see that these also themselves, whereas they become not Jews, yet become Christians, and that the prophets spoke not of them, who, through purpose of continence seeking not marriage, make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Is any one so madly opposed to the truth as to believe that eunuchs made so in the flesh have a better place than married persons in the house of God, and to contend that persons being a pious purpose continent, chastening the body even unto contempt of marriage, making themselves eunuchs, not in the body, but in the very root of concupiscence, practicing an heavenly and angelic life in an earthly mortal state, are on a level with the deserts of the married, and being a Christian, to gainsay Christ when he praises those who have made themselves eunuchs, not for the sake of the world, but for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, affirming that this is of use for the present life, not for a future? What else remains for these, save to assert that the kingdom of heaven itself pertains unto this temporal life wherein we now are? For why should not blind presumption advance even to this madness? And what more full of frenzy than this assertion? For, although at times the church, even that which is at this time, is called the kingdom of heaven, certainly it is so called for this end, because it is being gathered together for a future and eternal life. Although, therefore, it have the promise of the present and of a future life, yet in all its works it looks not to the things that are seen, but to what are not seen. For what are seen are temporal, but what are not seen are eternal. Nor, indeed, has the Holy Spirit failed to speak what should be of open and unshaken avail against these men, most shamelessly and madly obstinate, and should repel their assault as of wild beasts from his sheepfold by defenses that may not be stormed. For, after he had said concerning eunuchs, 
I will give unto them in my house and in my wall a named place much better than of sons and daughters, lest any too carnal should think that there was anything temporal to be hoped for in these words. Straight away he added, An eternal name I will give unto them, nor shall it ever fail, as though he should say, Why do you draw back in pious blindness? Why do you draw back? Why do you pour the clouds of your perverseness over the clear sky of truth? Why, in so great light of scriptures, do you seek after darkness from out which to lay snares? Why do you promise temporal advantage only to holy persons exercising continence? An eternal name I will give unto them. Why, were persons kept from all sexual intercourse, and also in the very fact that they abstain from these, have thought of the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, do you essay to refer them unto earthly advantage? An eternal name I will give unto them. Why contend you that the kingdom of heaven, for the sake of which holy eunuchs have made themselves eunuchs, is to be understood in this life only? An eternal name I will give unto them. And if haply in this place you endeavor to make the word itself eternal, in the sense of lasting for a long time, I add, I heap up, I tread in, nor shall it ever fail. What more seek you? What more say you? This eternal name, whatever it be, unto the eunuchs of God, which assuredly signifies a certain peculiar and excellent glory, shall not be in common with many, although as set in the same kingdom and in the same house. For on this account also, perhaps, it is called a name, that it distinguishes those to whom it is given from the rest. What then, say they, is the meaning of that penny, which is given in payment to all alike when the work of the vineyard is ended, whether it be to those who have labored from the first hour, or to those who have labored from one hour. What assuredly does it signify but something which all shall have in common, such as is life eternal itself, the kingdom of heaven itself, where shall be all whom God has predestined, called justified, glorified. For it behooves that this corruptible put on incorruption, and this mortal put on immortality. This is that penny wages for all, yet star differs from star in glory, so also the resurrection of the dead. These are the different merits of the saints. For, if by that penny the heaven were signified, have not all the stars in common to be in the heaven? And yet there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another of the stars. If that penny were taken for health of body, have not all the members, when we are well, health in common? And should this health continue even unto death, is it not in all alike and equally? And yet God has set the members, each one of them, in the body as he would, that neither the whole be an eye, nor the whole hearing, nor the whole smelling, and whatever else there is, it has its own property, although it have health equally with all. Thus, because life eternal itself shall be alike to all, an equal penny was assigned to all, but because in that life eternal itself the lights of merit shall shine with a distinction, there are many mansions in the house of the Father. And by this he means, in the penny not unlike, one lives not longer than another, but in the many mansions one is honored with greater brightness than another. Therefore go on, saints of God, boys and girls, males and females, unmarried men and women, go on and persevere unto the end. Praise more sweetly the Lord, whom ye think on more richly. Hope more happily in him, whom ye serve more instantly. Love more ardently him, whom you please more attentively. With loins girded and lamps burning, wait for the Lord when he comes from the marriage. You shall bring unto the marriage of the Lamb a new song, which you shall sing on your harps, not surely such as the whole earth sings, unto which it is said, Sing unto the Lord a new song, sing unto the Lord the whole earth but such as no one shall be able to utter but you. For thus there saw you in the apocalypse a certain one beloved above others by the Lamb, who had been wont to lie on his breast, and who used to drink in and burst forth the word of God above wonders of heaven. He saw you twelve times twelve thousand of holy harpers, of undefiled virginity in body, of inviolate truth in heart. And he wrote of you, that you follow the Lamb wherever he shall go. Or think we that this Lamb goes, where no one either dares or is able to follow save you? Where think we that he goes? Into what glades and meadows? Where, I think, the grass are joys? 
not vain joys of this world lying madnesses, nor joys such as shall be in the kingdom of God itself, for the rest that are not virgins, but distinct from the portion of joys of all the rest. Joy of the virgins of Christ, of Christ, in Christ, with Christ, after Christ, through Christ, for Christ. The joys peculiar to the virgins of Christ are not the same as of such as are not virgins, although of Christ. For there are to different persons different joys, but to none such. Go, enter into these, follow the Lamb, because the flesh of the Lamb also is assuredly virgin. For this he retained in himself when grown up, and which he took not away from his mother by his conception and birth. Follow him, as you deserve, in virginity of heart and flesh, wheresoever he shall have gone. For what is it to follow but to imitate? Because Christ has suffered for us, leaving us an example, as says the Apostle Peter, that we should follow his steps. Him each one follows in that wherein he imitates him, not so far forth as he is the only Son of God, by whom all things were made, but so far forth as the Son of Man, he set forth in himself what behooved for us to imitate. And many things in him are set forth for all to imitate, but virginity of the flesh not for all, for they have not what to do in order to be virgins, in whom it has already been brought to pass that they be not virgins. Therefore, let the rest of the faithful who have lost virginity follow the Lamb not wherever he shall have gone, but so far as ever they shall have been able. But they are able everywhere, save when he walks in the grace of virginity. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Imitate him who, whereas he was rich, was made poor for your sakes. Blessed are the meek. Imitate him who said, Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Blessed are they that mourn. Imitate him, who wept over Jerusalem. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Imitate him, who said, My meat is to do the will of him who sent me. Blessed are the merciful. Imitate him, who came to the help of him who was wounded by robbers, and who lay in the way half dead and despaired of. Blessed are the pure of heart. Imitate him, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Blessed are the peacemakers. Imitate him, who said on behalf of his persecutors, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Blessed are they who suffer persecution for righteous sake. Imitate him, who suffered for you, leaving you an example that you follow his steps. These things, whoever imitate, in these they follow the Lamb. But surely even married persons may go in those steps, although not setting their foot perfectly in the same print, yet walking in the same paths. But lo, that the Lamb goes by a virgin road. How shall they go after him, who have lost, but there is no way for them to recover? Do ye, therefore, do ye go after him, his virgins? Do ye, there, also go after him, in that on this one account, wherever he shall have gone, you follow him? For unto any other gift whatsoever of holiness, whereby to follow him, we can exhort married persons, save this which they have lost beyond power of recovery. Follow him, therefore, by holding with perseverance what you have vowed with ardor. Go when you can, that the good of virginity perish not from you, unto which you can do nothing, in order that it may return. The rest of the multitude of the faithful will see you, which cannot unto this follow the Lamb. It will see you, it will not envy you, and by rejoicing together with you what it has not in itself, it will have in you. For that new song also, which is your own, it will not be able to utter, but it will not be unable to hear, and to be delighted with your so excellent good. But you, who shall both utter and hear, in that what you shall say, this you shall hear of yourselves, will exult with greater happiness, and reign with greater joy. But they will have no sorrow on account of your greater joy, to whom this shall be wanting. Forsooth, that Lamb, whom you shall follow wherever he shall have gone, will not desert those who cannot follow him where you can. Almighty is the Lamb of whom we speak. We both will go before you and will not depart from them when God shall be in all. And they who shall have less shall not turn away in dislike from you. For where there is no envying, difference exists with concord. Take to you, then, have trust, be strong, continue, 
you who vow and pay unto the Lord your vows of perpetual continence, not for the sake of this present world, but for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. End of sections 18 through 29. Sections 30 through 41 of Of Holy Virginity de Virginitate by St. Augustine of Hippo, translated by Charles John Cornish, 1810 to 1870. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. You also, who have not yet made this vow, who are able to receive it, receive it. Run with perseverance, that you may obtain. Take ye each his sacrifices, and enter ye into the courts of the Lord, not of necessity, having power over your own will. For not as you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, can it so be said, you shall not wed. The former are demanded, the latter are offered. If the latter are done, they are praised. Unless the former are done, they are condemned. In the former the Lord commands us what is due. But in the latter, if you shall have spent anything more, on his return he will repay you. Think of whatever that be within his wall, a place named much better than of sons and of daughters. Think of an eternal name there, who unfolds of what kind that name shall be. Yet, wherever it shall be, it shall be eternal. By believing and hoping and loving this, you have been able not to shun marriage as forbidden, but to fly past it as allowed. Whence the greatness of this service, unto the undertaking of which we have according to our strength exhorted, the more excellent and divine it is, the more does it warn our anxiety to say something not only concerning most glorious chastity, but also concerning safest humility. When, then, such as make profession of perpetual chastity, comparing themselves with married persons, shall have discovered that, according to the scripture, the others are below both in work and wages, both in vow and reward, let what is written straightway come into their mind. By how much you have are great, by so much humble yourself in all things, and you shall find favor before God. The measure of humility for each has been given from the measure of his greatness itself unto which pride is full of danger, which lays the greater weight against persons, the greater they be. On this follows envying, as a daughter in her train. Forsooth pride straightway gives birth to her, nor is she ever without such a daughter and companion. By which two evils, that is pride and envying, is the devil a devil. Therefore it is against pride, the mother of envying, that the whole Christian discipline chiefly wars. For this teaches humility, whereby both to gain and to keep charity, of which, after that it has been said, charity envies not, as though we were asking the reason how it comes to pass that it envies not, he straightway added, is not puffed up, as though he should say, on this account it has not envying, in that neither has it pride. Therefore the teacher of humility, Christ, first emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, made in the likeness of men, and found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, made obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. But his teaching itself, how carefully it suggests humility, and how earnest and instant it is in commanding this, who can easily unfold and bring together all witnesses for proof of this matter? This let him essay to do, or do whatever shall wish to write a separate treatise on humility. But, of this present work, the end proposed is different, and it has been undertaken on a matter so great as that it has chiefly to guard against pride. Wherefore, a few witnesses, which the Lord deigns to suggest in my mind, I proceed to mention from out the teaching of Christ concerning humility, such as perhaps may be enough for my purpose. His discourse, the first which he delivered to his disciples at greater length, began from this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And these, without all controversy, we take to be humble. The faith of that centurion he on this account chiefly praised, and said that he had not found in Israel so great faith, because he believed with so great humility as to say, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Whence also Matthew, for no other reason, said that he came unto Jesus, whereas Luke most plainly signifies that he came not unto him himself, but sent his friends, save that by his most faithful humility he himself came unto him more than they whom he sent. Whence also is that of the prophet, The Lord is very high, and has respect unto things that are lowly, 
but what are very high he notes afar off, assuredly as not coming unto him. Whence also he says to that woman of Canaan, O woman, great is your faith, be it done unto you as you will. Whom above he had called a dog, and had made answer that the bread of the sons was not to be cast to her. And this, as she taking with humility, had said, Even so, Lord, for the dogs also eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And thus what by continual crying she obtained not, by humble confession she earned. Hence also those who are set forth praying in the temple, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican, for the sake of those who seem to themselves just and despise the rest of men, and the confession of sins is set before the reckoning up of merits. And assuredly the Pharisee was rendering thanks unto God by reason of those things wherein he was greatly self-satisfied. I render thanks to you, says he, that I am not even as the rest of men, unjust extortioners, adulterers, even as also this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all things whatsoever I possess. But the publican was standing afar off, not daring to lift up his eyes to heaven, but beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But there follows the divine judgment. Verily I say unto you, the publican went down from the temple justified more than that Pharisee. Then the cause is shown, why this is just. For as much as he who exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Therefore it may come to pass that each one both shun real evils and reflect on real goods in himself and render thanks for these unto the Father of lights, from whom comes down every best gift and every perfect gift, and yet be rejected by reason of the sin of haughtiness, if through pride, even in his thought alone, which is before God, he insults other sinners, and especially when confessing their sins in prayer, unto whom is due not upbraiding with arrogance, but pity without despair. What is it that, when his disciples were questioning among themselves who of them should be greater, he set a little child before their eyes, saying, Unless you shall be as this child, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven? Did he not chiefly commend humility, and set in it the desert of greatness? Or when unto the sons of Zebedee desiring to be as his side in lofty seats, he so made answer, as that they should rather think of having to drink the cup of his passion, wherein he humbled himself even unto death, even the death of the cross, then with proud desire demand to be preferred to the rest. What did he show, save that he would be a bestower of exaltation upon them, who should first follow him as a teacher of humility? And now, in that, when, about to go forth unto his passion, he washed the feet of his disciples, and most openly taught them to do for their fellow disciples and fellow servants this, which he their Lord and Master had done for them, how greatly did he commend humility? And in order to commend this, he chose also that time wherein they were looking on him as immediately about to die, with great longing, assuredly about to retain in their memory this especially, which their master, whom they were to imitate, had pointed out to them as the last thing. But he did this at such that time, which surely he could have done on other days also before, wherein he had been conversant with them, at which time, if it were done, this same would indeed be delivered, but certainly would not be so received. Whereas then all Christians have to guard humility, for as much as it is from Christ that they are called Christians, whose gospel no one considers with care, but that he discovers him to be a teacher of humility. Specially it is becoming that they be followers and keepers of this virtue, who excel the rest of men in any great good, in order that they may have a great care of that, which I set down in the beginning, by how much great you are great, by so much humble yourselves in all things, and you shall find grace before God. Wherefore, because perpetual continence and specially virginity is a great good in the saints of God, they must with all watchfulness beware that it be not corrupted with pride. Paul, the apostle, censures evil in unmarried women, curious and prating, and says that this fault comes of idleness. But at the same time, says he, being idle, they learn to go about to houses, but not only idle, but curious also, and prating, speaking what they ought not. Of these he had said above, but younger widows avoid, for when they have passed their time in delights, they wish to wed to Christ, 
having condemnation, in that they have made void their first faith, that is, have not continued in that which they had vowed at the first. And yet he says not, they marry, but they wish to marry. For many of them are recalled from marrying, not by love of a noble purpose, but of fear of open shame, which also itself comes of pride, whereby persons fear to displease men more than God. These, therefore, who wish to marry, and do not marry on this account, because they cannot with impunity, who would do better to marry than to be burned, that is, than to be laid waste in their very conscience by the hidden flame of lust, who repent of their profession, and who feel their confession irksome. Unless they correct and set right their heart, and by the fear of God again overcome their lust, must be accounted among the dead. Whether they pass their time in delights, whence the apostle says, but she who passes her time in delights living is dead, or whether in labors and fastings, which are useless, where there is no correction of the heart, and serve rather for display than amendment. I do not, for my part, impose on such a great regard for humility, in whom pride itself is confounded, and blood-stained by wound of conscience, nor on such as are drunken or covetous, or who are lying in any other kind whatever of damnable disease, at the same time that they have profession of bodily continence, and through perverse matters, are at variance with their own name, do I impose this great anxiety about pious humility, unless haply in these evils they shall dare even to make a display of themselves, unto whom it is not enough that the punishments of these are deferred. Nor am I treating of these, in whom there is a certain aim of pleasing, either by more elegant dress than the necessity of so great profession demands, or by remarkable manner of binding the head, whether by bosses of hair swirling forth, or by covering so yielding that the fine network below appears. Unto these we must give precepts, not as yet concerning humility, but concerning chastity itself, or virgin modesty. Give me one who makes profession of perpetual continence, and who is free from these, and all such faults and spots of conduct. For this one I fear pride, for this so great good I am in alarm from swelling of arrogance. The more there is in any one on account of which to be self-pleased, the more I fear, lest, by pleasing self, he pleases not him, who resists the proud, but unto the humble gives grace. Certainly we are to contemplate in Christ himself the chief instruction and pattern of virginal purity. What further precept than concerning humility shall I give to the continent than what he says to all? Learn of me, in that I am meek and lowly of heart." when he had made mention above of his greatness, and wishing to show this very thing, how great he was, and how little he had been made for our sakes, says, I confess to you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, in that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, and have revealed them unto the little children. Even so, O Father, in that so it has been pleasing before you. All things have been delivered unto me of my Father, and no one knows the Son save the Father, and no one knows the Father save the Son, and he to whom the Son shall have will to reveal him. Come unto me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, in that I am meek and lowly of heart. He, he, unto whom the Father has delivered all things, and whom no one knows but the Father, and whom alone, and he unto whom he shall have will to reveal him, knows the Father, says not, learn of me to make the world, or to raise the dead, but in that I am meek and lowly of heart. O saving teaching, O saving teaching, O teacher and Lord of mortals, unto whom death was pledged and passed on in the cup of pride, he would not teach what himself was not, he would not bid what himself did not. I see you, O good Jesus, with the eyes of faith which you have opened for me, as in an assembly of the human race, crying out and saying, Come unto me, and learn of me. What, I beseech you, through whom all things were made, O Son of God, and the same who was made among all things, O Son of Man, to learn what of you come we to you? For that I am meek, says he, and lowly of heart. Is it to this that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden in you are brought, that we learn this of you as a great thing, 
that you are meek and lowly of heart? Is it so great a thing it to be little, that it could not at all be learned unless it were brought to pass by you, who art so great? So indeed it is. For by no other way is there found out rest for the soul, save when the unquiet swelling has been dispersed, whereby it was great unto itself, when it was not sound unto you. Let them hear you, and let them come to you, and let them learn of you, and to be meek and lowly, who seek your mercy and truth, by living unto you, unto you, not unto themselves. Let him hear this, laboring and laden, who is weighed down by his burden, so as not to dare to lift up his eyes to heaven, that sinner beating his breast, and drawing near from afar. Let him hear the centurion, not worthy that you should enter under his roof. Let him hear Zacchaeus, chief of publicans, restoring fourfold the gains of damnable sins. Let her hear the woman in the city a sinner, by so much the more full of tears at your feet, the more alien as she had been from your steps. Let them hear the harlots and publicans who enter into the kingdom of heaven before the scribes and Pharisees. Let them hear every kind of such ones, feastings with whom were cast in your teeth as a charge, forsooth, as though by whole persons who sought not a physician, whereas you came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. All these, when they are converted unto you, easily grow meek and are humble before you, mindful of their own most unrighteous life and of your most indulgent mercy, in that where sin has abounded, grace has abounded more. But regard the troops of virgins, holy boys and girls. This kind has been trained up in your church. There for you it has been budding from its mother's breasts. For your name it has loosed its tongue to speak. Your name as through the milk of its infancy it has had poured in and has sucked, no one of this number can say, I, who before was a blasphemer and persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy in that I did in being ignorant in unbelief. Yea, more, that which you did not command, but only set forth for such as would to seize, saying, Whoever can receive, let him receive. They have seized and have vowed, and for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, not for you threatened, but for that you exhorted, they have made themselves eunuchs. To these cry out, let these hear you, in that you are meek and lowly of heart. Let these, by how much they are great, by so much humble themselves in all things, that they may find grace before you. They are just, but they are not, are they, such as you, justifying the ungodly? They are chaste, but them in sins their mothers nurtured in their wombs. They are holy, but you are also holy of holies. They are virgins, but they are not born of virgins. They are holy chaste, both in spirit and in flesh, but they are not the word made flesh. And yet let them learn, not from those unto whom you forgive sins, but from you yourself, the Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world, in that you are meek and lowly of heart. I send you not, soul that art religiously chaste, that hast not given the reins to fleshly appetite even so far as to allowed marriage, that hast not indulged your body about to depart even to the beginning one to succeed you, that has sustained aloft your earthly members afloat to accustom them to heaven. I send you not in order that you may learn humility unto publicans and sinners, who yet enter into the kingdom of heaven before the proud. I send you not to these, for they who have been set free from the gulf of uncleanness, are unworthy that undefiled virginity be sent to them to take pattern from. I send you unto the King of heaven, unto him by whom men were created, and who was created among men for the sake of men, unto him who is fair of beauty above the sons of men, and despised by the sons of men on behalf of the sons of men, unto him who, ruling the immortal angels, disdained not to do service unto mortals, him, at any rate, not unrighteousness, but charity made humble. Charity, which rivals not, is not puffed up, seeks not her own. For as much as Christ also pleased not himself, but, as it is written of him, the reproaches of such as reproached, you have fallen upon me. Go then, come unto him, and learn, in that he is meek and lowly of heart. You shall not go unto him, who dared not by reason of the 
burden of righteousness to lift up his eyes to heaven, but unto him who by the weight of charity came down from heaven. You shall not go unto her who watered with tears the feet of her Lord, seeking forgiveness of heavy sins. But you shall go unto him who, granting forgiveness of all sins, washed the feet of his own disciples. I know the dignity of your virginity. I propose not to you to imitate the publican humbly accusing his own faults, but I fear for the Pharisee proudly boasting of his own merits. I say not, be such as she, of whom it was said, there are forgiven unto her many sins, in that she has loved much. But I fear less, as thinking that you have little forgiven to you, you love little. I fear, I say, greatly for you, lest, when you boast that you will follow the Lamb wheresoever he shall have gone, you be unable by reason of swelling pride to follow him through straight ways. It is good for you, O virgin soul, that thus, as you are a virgin, thus altogether keeping in your heart that you have been born again, keeping in your flesh that you have been born, you yet conceive of the fear of the Lord, and give birth to the spirit of salvation. Fear, indeed, there is not in charity, but perfect charity, as it is written, casts out fear. But fear of men, not of God. Fear of temporal evils, not of the divine judgment at the last. Be not high-minded, but fear. Love the goodness of God, fear his severity, neither suffers you to be proud. For by loving you fear, lest you grievously offend one who is loved and, and loves. For what more grievous offense than that by pride you displease him who for your sake has been displeasing to the proud? And where ought there to be more that chaste fear abiding forever and ever than in you, who hast no thought of the things of this world, how to please a wedded partner, but of the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord? That other fear is not in charity, but this chaste fear quits not charity. If you love not, fear lest you perish. If you love, fear lest you displease. That fear charity casts out, with this it runs within. The Apostle Paul also says, For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption of sons, wherein we cry, Abba, Father. I believe that he speaks of that fear which had been given in the Old Testament, lest the temple goods should be lost, which God had promised unto those, not yet sons under grace, but as yet slaves under the law. There was also the fear of eternal fire, to serve God in order to avoid what is assuredly not yet of perfect charity. For the desire of the reward is one thing, the fear of punishment another. They are different sayings, whither shall I go away from your spirit, and from your face whither shall I flee, and one thing I have sought of the Lord, this I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord through all the days of my life, that I may consider the delight of the Lord, that I be protected in his temple, and turn not away your face from me, and my soul longs and faints unto the courts of the Lord. Those sayings let him have head, who dared not to lift up his eyes to heaven, and she who was watering with tears his feet in order to obtain pardon for her grievous sins. But these do you have, who art careful about the things of the Lord, to be holy both in body and spirit. With these sayings, their company's fear which has torment, which perfect charity casts out. But with these sayings, their company's chaste fear of the Lord, that abides for ever and ever. And to both kinds, it must be said, be not high-minded, but fear, that man, neither of defense of his sins, nor of presumption of righteousness, set himself up. For Paul also himself, who says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, yet fear, being a companion of charity, says, With fear and much trembling I was towards you. And that saying which I have mentioned, that the engraft wild olive tree be not proud against the broken branches of the olive tree, himself made use of, saying, Be not high-minded, but fear, himself admonishing all the members of Christ in general, says, With fear and trembling, work out your own salvation, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do, according to his good pleasure. That it seem not to pertain unto the Old Testament what is written, Serve the Lord in fear, and rejoice unto him with trembling. And what members of the holy body, which is the church, ought more to take care that upon them the Holy Spirit may rest than such as profess virginal holiness? But how does he rest where he finds not his own place? 
What else than an humbled heart, to fill, not to leap back from, to raise up, not to weigh down? Whereas it has been most plainly said, On whom shall rest my spirit? On him that is humble and quiet, and trembles at my words. Already you live righteously, already you live piously, you live chastely, holily, with virginal purity, and yet, however, you live here, and are you not humbled at hearing what is not human life upon earth a trial? Does it not drive you back from overconfident arrogance, woe unto the world because of offenses? Do you not tremble, lest you be accounted among the many whose love waxes cold because that iniquity abounds? Do you not smite your breast when you hear, Wherefore, whoever thinks that he stands, let him see to it lest he fall? Amid these divine warnings and human dangers, do we yet find it so hard to persuade holy virgins to humility? Or are we indeed to believe that it is for any other reason that God suffers to be mixed up with the number of your profession, many, both men and women, about to fall, than that by the fall of these your fear may be increased, whereby to repress pride, which God so hates, as that against this one thing the highest humbled himself? Unless haply, in truth, you shall therefore fear less, and be more puffed up, so as to love little him who has loved you so much as to give up himself for you, because he has forgiven you little, living forsooth from childhood religiously, piously, with pious chastity, with inviolate virginity, as though in truth you ought not to love with much greater glow of affection him who, whatsoever things he has forgiven unto sinners upon their being turned to him, suffered you not to fall into them. Or indeed that Pharisee, who therefore loved little, because he thought that little was forgiven him, was it for any other reason that he was blinded by this error, than because being ignorant of the righteousness of God, and seeking to establish his own, he had not been made subject unto the righteousness of God? But you, an elect race, and among the elect more elect, virgin choirs that follow the Lamb, even you, by grace, have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God, not of works, lest haply any be elated, for we are his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ, in good works, which God has prepared, that in them we may walk. What, therefore, by how much the more you are adorned by his gifts, shall you by so much the less love him? May he himself turn away so dreadful madness, wherefore, for as much as the truth has spoken the truth, that he, unto whom little is forgiven, loves little, do ye, in order that you may love with full glow of affection him whom you are free to love, being loosened from ties of marriage, account as altogether forgiven unto you, whatever evil by his governance you have not committed. For your eyes ever unto the Lord, for as much as he shall pluck out of the net your feet, and except the Lord shall have kept the city, in vain has he watched who keeps it. And speaking of continence itself, the apostle says, But I would that all men were as I myself, but each one has his own proper gift from God, one in this way, and another in that way. Who therefore bestows these gifts? Who distributes his own proper gifts unto each as he will? Forsooth God, with whom there is not unrighteousness, and by this means, with what equity he makes some in this way, and others in that way, for man to know is either impossible or altogether hard, but to that with equity he makes, it is not lawful to doubt. What, therefore, have you, which you have not received? And by what perversity do you less love him, of whom you have received more? End of sections 30 through 41《セクション s 42 through 57 of Of Holy Virginity, De Virginitate by Saint Augustine of Hippo, translated by Charles John Cornish, 1810-1870. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wherefore, let this be the first thought for the putting on of humility, that God's virgin think not that it is of herself that she is such, and not rather that this best gift comes down from above, from the Father of Lights, with whom is no change nor shadow of motion. For thus she will not think that little has been forgiven her, so as for her to love little, 
and being ignorant of the righteousness of God, and wishing to establish her own, not to be made subject to the righteousness of God, in which fault was that Simon, who was surpassed by the woman, unto whom many sins were forgiven, because she loved much. But she will have more cautious and true thoughts, that we are so to account all sins as though forgiven, from which God keeps us, that we commit them not. Witnesses are those expressions of pious prayers in holy scriptures, whereby it is shown that those very things which are commanded by God are not done, save by his gift and help, who commands. For there is a falsehood in the asking for them, if we could do them without the help of his grace. What is there so generously and chiefly charged as obedience, whereby the commandments of God are kept? And yet we find this wished for. You, says he, has charged that your commandments be greatly kept. Then it follows, O oh, that my ways were directed to keep your righteousness. Then shall I not be confounded, while I look unto all your commandments. That which he had set down above that God had commanded, that he wished might of himself be fulfilled. This is done assuredly, that there be not sin. But, if there has been sin, the command is that one repent, lest by defense and excuse of sin he perish through pride, who has done it, while he is unwilling that what he has done perish through repentance. This also is asked of God, who, that it may be understood, that it is not done, save by his grant from whom it is asked. Set, says he, O Lord, a watch to my mouth, and a door of continence around my lips. Let not my heart turn away unto evil words, to make excuses and sins with men that work unrighteousness. If therefore both obedience, whereby we keep his commandments, and repentance, whereby we excuse not our sins, are wished for and asked, it is plain that, when it is done, it is by his gift that it is possessed, by his help that it is fulfilled, yet more openly is it said by reason of obedience. By the Lord the steps of a man are directed, and he shall will his way. And of repentance the apostle says, If haply God may grant unto them repentance. Concerning continence also itself, has it not been most openly said, And when I knew that no one can be continent unless God give it, this also itself was a part of wisdom, to know whose gift it was? But perhaps continence is the gift of God, but wisdom man bestows upon himself, whereby to understand that it, that gift is not his own, but of God. Yea, the Lord makes wise the blind, and... The testimony of the Lord is faithful, it gives wisdom unto little ones. And, if any one want wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives unto all liberally, and upbraids not, and it shall be given to him. But it becomes virgins to be wise, that their lamps be not extinguished. How wise, save not having high thoughts, but consenting unto the lowly. For wisdom itself has said to man, Lo, piety is wisdom. If, therefore, you have nothing which you have not received, be not high-minded, but fear, and love not little, as though him by whom little has been given to you, but rather love him much, by whom much has been given to you. For if he loves, unto whom it has been given not to repay, how much more ought he to love, unto whom it has been given to possess? For both whoever continues chaste from the beginning is ruled by him, and whoever is made chaste instead of unchaste is corrected by him, and whoever is unchaste even unto the end is abandoned by him. But this he can do by secret counsel, by righteousness he cannot, and perhaps it is for this end that it lies hid, that there may be more fear and less pride. Next, let not man now that he knows that by the grace of God he is what he is, fall into another snare of pride, so as by lifting up himself for the very grace of God to despise the rest, by which fault that other Pharisee both gave thanks unto God for the good which he had, and yet vaunted himself above the publican confessing his sins. What therefore should a virgin do? What should she think? That she vaunt not herself above those men or women who have not this so great gift? For she ought not to feign humility, but to set it forth. For the feigning of humility is greater pride. Wherefore scripture, wishing to show that humility ought to be true, after having said, By how much you are great, 
by so much humble yourself in all things, added soon after, and you shall find grace before God, assuredly, where one could not humble one's self deceitfully. Wherefore, what shall we say? Is there any thought which a virgin of God may truly have, by reason of which she dare not to set herself before a faithful woman, not only a widow, but even married? I say not a reprobate virgin, for who knows not that an obedient woman is to be set before a disobedient virgin, but where both are obedient unto the commandments of God, shall she so tremble to prefer holy virginity even to chaste marriage and continence to wedded life, the fruit an hundredfold to go before the thirtyfold? Nay, let her not doubt to prefer this thing to that thing. Yet let not this or that virgin, obeying and fearing God, dare to set herself before this or that woman, obeying and fearing God. Otherwise she will not be humble, and God resist the proud. What, therefore, shall she have in her thoughts? Forsooth, the hidden gifts of God, which not save the questioning of trial, makes known to each, even in himself. For, to pass over the rest, whence does a virgin know, although careful of the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but that haply, by reason of some weakness of mind known to herself, she be not as yet ripe for martyrdom, whereas that woman, whom she rejoiced to set herself before, may already be able to drink the cup of the Lord's humiliation, which he set before his disciples, to drink first, when enamored of high place. Whence, I say, does she know, but that she herself be not as yet Thecla, that other be already Crispina? Certainly, unless there be present trial, there takes place no proof of this gift. But this is so great, that certain understand it to be the fruit of an hundredfold, for the authority of the church bears a very conspicuous witness, in which it is known to the faithful in what place the martyrs, in what place the holy nuns deceased, are rehearsed at the sacraments of the altar. But what the meaning is of that difference of fruitfulness, let them see to it, who understand these things better than we, whether the virginal life be in fruit an hundredfold, in sixtyfold the widowhood, in thirtyfold the married, or whether the hundredfold fruitfulness be ascribed unto martyrdom, the sixtyfold unto continence, the thirtyfold unto marriage, or whether virginity, and by the addition of martyrdom, fill up the hundredfold, but when alone be in sixtyfold, but married persons bearing thirtyfold arrive at sixtyfold, in case they shall be martyrs, or whatever, what seems to be more probable, for as much as the gifts of divine grace are many, and one is greater and better than another, whence the apostle says, but emulate ye the better gifts, we are to understand that they are more in number than to allow of being distributed under those different kinds. In the first place, that we set not widowed continents either as bearing no fruit, or set it but level with the desert of married charity, or equal it unto virgin glory, or think that the crown of martyrdom, either established in habit of mind, although proof of trial be wanting, or an actual making trial of suffering, be added unto either one of these two chastities, without any increase of fruitfulness. Next, when we set it down, that many men and women so keep virginal chastity, as that yet they do not the things which the Lord says, If you will be perfect, go and sell all that you have, and give unto the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me, and do not unite themselves to those dwelling together, among whom one says that any thing is his own, but all things are unto them common. Do we think that there is no addition of fruitfulness unto the virgins of God when they do this, or that the virgins of God are without any fruit, although they do not this? Therefore, there are many gifts, and some brighter and higher than others, each than each, and at some times one is fruitful in fewer gifts, but better, another in lower gifts, but more. And in what manner they be either made equal one to another, or distinguished one from another, in receiving eternal honors, who of men would dare to pronounce? Whereas yet it is plain both that those differences are many, and that the better are profitable not for the present time, but for eternity. But I judge that the Lord willed to make mention of three differences of fruitfulness, the rest he left to such as understand. For also another evangelist has made mention only of the hundredfold, 
We are not, therefore, are we, to think that he either rejected or knew not of the other two, but rather that he left them to be understood? But, as I begun to say, whether the fruit of an hundredfold be virginity dedicated to God, or whether we are to understand that interval of fruitfulness in some other way, either such as we have made mention of, or such as we have not made mention of, yet no one, as I suppose, will have dared to prefer virginity to martyrdom, and no one will have doubted that this latter gift is hidden, if trial to test it be wanting. A virgin, therefore, has a subject for thought, such as may be of profit to her for the keeping of humility, that she violate not that charity which is above all gifts, without which assuredly whatever other gifts she shall have had, whether few or many, whether great or small, she is nothing. She has, I say, a subject for thought, that she be not puffed up, that she rival not, forsooth, that she so make profession, that the virginal good is much greater and better than the married good, as that yet she know not whether this or that married woman be not already able to suffer for Christ, but herself as yet unable, and she herein spared that her weakness is not put to the question by trial. For God, says the apostle, is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tried above that which you are able, but will make with the trial a way out, that you may be able to bear it. Perhaps, therefore, those men or women, keeping a way of married life praiseworthy in its kind, are already able, against an enemy forcing to unrighteousness, to contend even by tearing in pieces of bowels, then shedding of blood, but these men or women, continent from childhood and making themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, still are not as yet able to endure such either for righteousness or for chastity itself. For it is one thing, for truth and an holy purpose, not to consent unto one who would persuade and flatter, but another thing not to yield even to one who tortures and strikes. These lie hidden in the powers and strengths of souls. By trial they are unfolded, by actual essay they come forth. In order, therefore, that each be not puffed up by reason of that which he sees clearly that he can do, let him humbly consider that he knows not that there is perchance something more excellent which he cannot do, but that some who neither have nor profess that of which he is lawfully self-conscious are able to do this which he himself cannot do. Thus will be kept, not by feigned, but by true humility, in honor preventing one another, and esteeming each other higher than himself. What now shall I say concerning the very carefulness and watchfulness against sin? Who shall boast that he has a chaste heart, or who shall boast that he is clean from sin? Holy virginity is indeed inviolate from the mother's womb. But no one, says he, is clean in your sight, not even the infant whose life is of one day upon the earth. There is kept also in faith and violet and certain virginal chastity, whereby the church is joined as a chaste virgin unto one husband. But that one husband has taught, not only the faithful who are virgin in mind and body, but all Christians altogether, from spiritual even unto carnal, from apostles even unto the last penitents, as though from the height of heaven even unto the bounds of it, to pray, and in the prayer itself has admonished them to say, and forgive us our debts, even as we also forgive our debtors. Where, by this which we seek, he shows what also we should remember that we are. For neither on behalf of those debts, which for our whole past life we trust have been forgiven unto us in baptism through his peace, has he charged us to pray, saying, And forgive us our debts, even as we also forgive our debtors. Otherwise, this were a prayer which catechumens rather ought to pray up in the time of baptism. But, whereas it is what baptized persons pray, rulers and people, pastors and flocks, it is sufficiently shown that in this life, the whole of which is a trial, no one ought to boast himself as though free from all sins. Wherefore also the virgins of God, without blame indeed, follow the Lamb wherever he shall have gone, both the cleansing of sins being perfected and virginity being kept, which, were it lost, could not return. But, because the same apocalypse itself, wherein such unto one such were revealed, in this also praises them, that in their mouth 
there was not found a lie. Let them remember in this also to be true, that they dare not say that they have not sinned. Forsooth the same John, who saw that, has said this, If we shall have said that we have not sinned, we deceive our own selves, and the truth is not in us. But if we shall have confessed our faults, he is faithful and just, and so as to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we shall have said that we have not sinned, we shall make him a liar, and his word shall not be in us. This surely is not said to these or those, but unto all Christians, wherein virgins also ought to recognize themselves. For thus they shall be without a lie, such as in the apocalypse they appeared. And by this meaning, so long as there is not as yet perfection in heavenly height, confession in lowliness makes them without blame. But again, lest by occasion of this sentence any one should sin with deadly security, and should allow himself to be carried away, as though his sins were soon by easy confession to be blotted out, he straightway added, My little children, these things have I written unto you, that you sin not. And, if one shall have sinned, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and himself is a propitiation of our sins. Let no one therefore depart from sin, as though about to return to it, nor bind himself, as it were, by compact of alliance of this kind with unrighteousness, so as to take delight rather to confess than to shun it. But, forasmuch as even upon such as are busy and on the watch not to sin, there creep by stealth in a certain way from human weakness, sins, however small, however few, yet not none, these same themselves become great and grievous, in case pride shall have added to them increase and weight. But by the priest whom we have in the heavens, if by pious humility they be destroyed, they are with all ease cleansed. But I contend not with those who assert that a man can in this life live without any sin. I contend not, I gainsay not, for perhaps we take measure of the great from out of our own misery, and comparing ourselves with ourselves understand not. One thing I know, that those great ones, such as we are not, such as we have not as yet made proof of, by how much they are great, by so much humble themselves in all things, that they may find grace before God. For, let them be how great soever they will, there is no servant greater than his Lord, nor disciple greater than his Master. And assuredly he is the Lord, who says, All things have been delivered unto me of my Father. And he is the Master, who says, Come unto me, all you who labor, and learn of me. And yet what learn we? In that I am meek, says he, and lowly of heart. Here some will say, This is now not to write of virginity, but of humility, as though truly it were any kind of virginity, and not that which is after God, which we had undertaken to set forth. And this good, by how much I see it to be great, by so much I fear for it, lest it be lost, the thief pride. Therefore there is none that guards the virginal good, save God himself who gave it, and God is charity. The guardian, therefore, of virginity is charity, but the place of this guardian is humility. There, forsooth, he dwells, who said, that on the lowly and quiet, and that trembles at his words, his spirit rests. What, therefore, have I done, formed from my purpose, if wishing the good, which I have praised, to be more securely guarded, I have taken care also to prepare a place for the guardian? For I speak with confidence, nor I have any fear, lest they be angry with me, whom I admonish with care to fear for themselves together with me. More easily do follow the Lamb, although not wherever he shall have gone, yet so far as they shall have had power, married persons who are humble, than virgins who are proud. For how does one follow him, unto whom one wills not to approach, or how does one approach him, unto whom one comes not to learn, in that I am meek and lowly and humble of heart? Where for those the Lamb leads following wherever he shall have gone, in whom first himself shall have found where to lay his head. For also a certain proud and crafty person had said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you shall have gone, to whom he made answer, Foxes have dens, and fowls of heaven nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. By the term of foxes he reproves wily craftiness, and by the name of birds puffed up arrogance, wherein he found not pious humility to rest in. 
and by this nowhere at all did he follow the Lord, who had promised that he would follow him, not unto a certain point of progress, but altogether wherever he should have gone. Wherefore this do ye, virgins of God, this do ye, follow ye the Lamb, wherever he shall have gone, but first come unto him whom you are to follow, and learn, in that he is meek and lowly of heart. Come ye in lowly wise unto the lowly, if you love, and depart not from him, lest ye fall. For whoever fears to depart from him asks and says, Let there not come to me foot of pride. Go on in the way of loftiness, with the foot of lowliness. Himself lifts up such as follow in lowly wise, who thought it not a trouble to come down unto him such as lay low. Commit ye his gifts unto him to keep, guard ye your strength unto him. Whatever of evil through his guardianship ye commit not, account as forgiven unto you by him, lest, thinking that you have little forgiven unto you, you love little, and with ruinous boasting despise the publicans beating their breasts. Concealing that strength of yours which has been tried, beware that you be not puffed up, because you have been able to bear something. But concerning that which has been untried, pray that you be not tempted above that you are able to bear. Think that some are superior to you in secret than whom you are openly better. Then the good things of others, happily unknown to you, are kindly believed by you. Your own that are known to you are not lessened by comparison, but strengthened by love. And what happily as yet are wanting are by so much the more easily forgiven, by how much they are the more humbly desired. Let such among your number as persevere afford to you an example, but let such as fall increase your fear. Love the one that you may imitate it, mourn over the other that you be not puffed up. Do not ye establish your own righteousness. Submit yourselves unto God, who justifies you. Pardon the sins of others. Pray for your own. Future sins shun by watching. Past sins blossom out by confessing. Lo, already you are such, as that in the rest of your conduct also ye correspond with the virginity which you have professed and kept. Lo, already not only do ye abstain from murders, devilish sacrifices and abominations, thefts, rapines, frauds, perjuries, drunkenness, and all luxury and avarice, hatreds and emulations, impieties, cruelties, but even those things which either are or are thought lighter are not found nor arise among you, not bold face, not wandering eyes, not unbridled tongue, not petulant laugh, not scurrilous jest, not unbecoming mane, not swelling or loose gait, Already ye render not evil for evil, nor curse for curse. Already, lastly, you fulfill that measure of love, that you lay down your lives for your brethren. Lo, already you are such, because also such ye ought to be. These, being added to virginity, set forth an angelic life unto men, and the way of heaven unto the earth. But, by how much you are great, whosoever of you are so great, by so much humble yourselves in all things, that you may find grace before God, that he resist you not as proud, that he humble you not as lifting up yourselves, that he lead you not through straits as being puffed up, although anxiety be unnecessary, that where charity glows, humility be not wanting. If, therefore, you despise marriages of sons of men, from which to beget the sons of men, love ye with your whole heart him who is fair of form above the sons of men. You have leisure, your heart is free from marriage bonds. Gaze on the beauty of your lover, think of him equal to the father, made subject also to his mother, ruling even in the heavens, and serving upon the earth, creating all things, created among all things. That very thing which in him the proud mock at, gaze on, how fair it is. With inward eyes, gaze on the wounds of him hanging, the scars of him rising again, the blood of him dying, the price of him that believes, the gain of him that redeems. Consider of how great value these are. Weigh them in the scales of charity, and whatever of love ye had to expend upon your marriages, pay back to him. It is well that he seeks your beauty within, where he has given unto you power to become daughters of God. He seeks not of you a fair flesh, but fair conduct, whereby to bridle also the flesh. He is not one unto whom any one can lie concerning you, and make him rage through jealousy. See with how great security ye love him, whom ye fear not to offend by false suspicions. Husband and wife love each other. 
in that they see each other, and what they see not, that they fear between themselves, nor have they sure delight in what is visible, while in what is concealed they usually suspect what is not. You in whom ye see not with the eyes, and behold by faith, neither have what is real to blame, nor fear lest haply ye offend him by what is false. If therefore ye should owe great love to husbands, him for whose sake ye would not have husbands, how greatly ought ye to love. Let him be fixed in your whole heart, who for you was fixed on the cross. Let him possess in your soul all that, whatever it be, that you would not have occupied by marriage. It is not lawful for you to love little him for whose sake you have not loved even what were lawful. So loving him who is meek and lowly of heart, I have no fear for you of pride. Thus, after our small measure, we have spoken enough both of sanctity, whereby you are properly called sanctimonialis, and of humility, whereby whatever great name ye bear is kept. But more worthily let those three children, unto whom he, whom they loved with full glow of heart, afforded refreshing in the fire, admonish you concerning this our little work, much more shortly indeed in number of words, but much more greatly in weight of authority, in the hymn wherein God is honored by them. For, joining humility unto holiness in such as praise God, they have most plainly taught that each, by how much he make any more holy profession, by so much do beware that he be not deceived by pride. Wherefore do ye also praise him, who grants unto you, that in the midst of the flames of this world, although ye be not joined in marriage, yet ye be not burned. And praying also for us, bless ye the Lord, you holy and humble men of heart, utter in him, and exalt him above all forever. End of sections 42 through 57 End of Of Holy Virginity de Virginitate by St. Augustine of Hippo Translated by Charles John Cornish, 1810-1870